Okay, so Invincible is like one of the best stories ever. This story is amazing. It's so cool. And here's the funny thing. People have been asking me to do this story for like months and months and months and months. And I was like, no, I'm probably not going to do Invincible because I really only ever read The Walking Dead. And I was like, okay, we're like, well, we'll read Invincible. Like, we'll see what it's about. Like, we'll give it a shot. Like, I'm in the process of moving, whatever. Like, I'm just looking for content to throw onto my channel while I'm gone. And I was like, okay, we'll just, we'll try Invincible and we'll see what happens. Uh, this story is, is absolutely nuts. I absolutely love this story. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely one of my favorites. So the cool thing about this is that the story actually picks up about four months before the present day. I mean, we'll fast forward, you know, over the over the course of that four month period. But we initially just pick up with just this young kid, you know, this kid named Mark, and he is just an average guy. Now, the funny thing about this is that this is kind of like a like a play on the comic trope, right? Like there's this average kid who discovers he can do incredible things. Like that's the whole <laughs> that's the whole gist of this story, you know, and the idea is that he's got a pretty mundane life. I mean, he's just your your average teenage kid who usually keeps his head in the books, right? Like, I mean, he's really smart. He studies a lot. He's got a few friends here and there, you know, but he's not by any means a kid who gets picked on, but he's not the popular kid. He's just the middle of the road guy. But the funny thing about this is that in the middle of throwing trash away, he suddenly discovers that it ends up being thrown like a mile into the air, which tells him that he has super strength. Now, the other half of this is that his dad is a super powered guy. And we'll learn a little bit more about him here in a second. But the whole funny thing about this situation is that it's not like Mark's mom is just like, oh my God, like I'm married to this super superhero guy and my son might be getting powers. It's just common stuff for all the grandiose, all the pomp and circumstance that she expresses by virtue of her husband explaining his adventurous day and being a superhero. He might as well have said he went to the grocery store and got some eggs. I mean, there's no grandiose moment here. And again, that's what makes it kind of cool is because we're used to like over the top superhero stuff, right? Like Lois Lane's like, Superman, what did you do today? He's like, well, first I fought Brainiac and then some guys were trying to rob a bank and I defeated them. Like we're, you know, it's this over the top, <laughs> over the top scenario. With this, it's a little more toned down and it's designed to kind of poke fun at those things here and there. Now, it's no secret that while I wouldn't say that Robert Kirkman is like cynical, that he is a guy who's just kind of like, okay, look, some of the superhero tropes are nonsensical and this is designed to sort of feed into that and kind of poke fun of it, but it's also designed to feed into the nature of comic books, right? Like comic books by definition are for the most part an escape from the world. It's a chance for us to sit down and to basically leave the real world behind and just sort of enjoy the adventures of some guy with incredible powers or some chick with incredible powers and just kind of follow them on their adventures and hopefully the stories are compelling enough to keep us coming back, but that's the goal. And so we basically get this Spider-Man-esque situation where it's this high school kid that realizes that he has incredible abilities, one of which is the power of flight. Now, to be honest, invulnerability is cool, super strength is cool, flight is like the best power somebody could have, to be honest. Because I mean, imagine what you could do with flight. Like, I mean, you're just like, oh my God, I'm late for work. And then you just like take off. You're just like, I'm just gonna fly there so I don't have to worry about traffic. I mean, it'd be amazing to have the power of flight. There's so many cool things you could do. I wouldn't have to worry about buying plane tickets to go to convention. I could just fly there. It'd be awesome. Just like, you know, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's comics explained. Like it'd be the coolest thing. <laughs> it'd be one of the coolest things ever to be able to pull off. But again, the other half of this is that this is a larger world. And it's really kind of what we would expect. I mean, we would expect this to have a little bit of a larger world that this guy, Mark, is not the only person out there that has powers. The other funny thing about this is that when he tells his dad, look, I think my powers are starting to emerge, his dad takes the most logical road. Now, the funny thing about this is his dad has a much bigger role to play within the confines of the whole Invincible series of comics, but his dad basically takes Mark under his wing, takes his son under his wing and says, look, one, you can't wear that costume. And two, we got to hone your skills because <laughs> this costume is absolutely pitiful. So of course he gets taken to a, to a costume guy. Now, again, this is the funny thing about all this is because in comic books, when it comes to superhero comics, when it comes to like costumes, the costumes are an intrinsic part of the superhero landscape. I mean, the S on Superman is more recognizable than the Christian cross, the Batman symbol, one of the most popular symbols ever created, Wonder Woman, the Flash, the Spider-Man logo, all these things stand the test of time as just being definitive, recognizable symbols of Hallmark heroes. I could walk up to anybody with just a circle and put Captain America's whole, you know, shield design on it and say, what is this and who does it belong to? And they're gonna say, oh, that's Captain America's shield. I mean, it's just one of the things that, that people just intrinsically know, that they inherently know. And so it makes sense that we would move in the direction of getting a costume. The way this kind of differs though is the nature by which he gets his costume. It's basically designed for him by a tailor, which is kind of cool. I mean, it's it's a guy that makes costumes for people. <laughs> That's kind of what he does. Now, it's not unheard of, right? Like in Marvel Comics, Spider-Man developed his own costume, Superman's costumes or his clothes that he was wrapped in when he was sent to Earth. Batman made his own costume. I mean, that's usually par for the course in terms of heroes, you know, getting their costumes made, whether they're made by somebody else or made by themselves. This is kind of cool because again, what this does is it also leaves him with the last remaining element, which is what his name 
game is going to be. Now, the other half of this is how Mark views himself as a superhero. Historically speaking, when it comes to people stepping into the role of being a good guy, when they develop powers and they realize they can do great things for the world, it goes one of two ways. Either they're just like, yeah, I can do amazing things for the world. I've got powers. I can make the world a better place. Or they're just like, I'm going to make myself rich. Like that's usually what happens. It's one of those two things. I would make myself rich, to be honest, if I had superpowers. I'd be like, I'm going to be a superhero just as soon as I'm done fighting my bank account. Like that's, that's the kind of thing that I would end up doing. But in this instance, Mark falls in line with the traditional role of a superhero. Now, again, this is the whole legacy of Spider-Man. Superman to a degree, but Spider-Man more so than anybody else. Most of Superman's stories are really covered, you know, at least in terms of how we think of him, are most of the stories that are covered when he's like Superman, right? Like when he goes through the whole era of like his teenage life and so on and so forth. And then now he's like, and I am Superman now. There are origin stories, you know, Jeff John's secret origins, different things like that, the focus on the life and times of Clark Kent before he became a superhero. But on the whole, most stories about Superman, about Batman, Wonder Woman, so on and so forth, they're adults, they're established, and they're just dealing with villains, different things like that. The uniqueness of Spider-Man came in the sense that he was a teenager. He hadn't grown up. And so when he got his powers, he did what a teenager who was taught that with great power must be must come great responsibility would do with those powers. And Peter Parker became a good guy. He stood up for the small guy. He didn't allow people to get bullied if he could keep it from happening. He beat the hell out of Flash Thompson. There's a lot of different things that he did with his powers. And Mark takes very much the same road. Now, it's not nearly as grandiose and not nearly as extensive. It's just a bully picking on a kid and Mark just pushes him into a locker and knocks him out. And that's really about it. But the name for his character comes during a meeting in the principal's office. And the principal kind of takes this interesting stance. This is one of those funny situations when it comes to the idea of how to navigate the waters of life and how to navigate those charted waters and different things like that. The role of the principal is a little more experienced and a little more wise, but a little more cynical than we would expect from Mark. Because remember, as a teenager and a kid who's just now developed his powers, Mark's pretty wide-eyed. I mean, he's, he's green around the ears. And so because of that, he still has this very much, you know, young kid high school approach, you know, where it's like, I can save the world. The beauty of this is that he actually has the power to do that. But with regards to the principal, the principal, again, is a little more cynical. He's like, hey, look, man, like there's folks that are just going to get picked on. That's just the way it is. You know, fo some folks get picked on, some folks don't. Uh, you could be the one that tries to save them, but you can't save everybody. So the only thing you could ever really do is keep your head in the books, keep your nose clean and get out of here, go on to a good college, which is pretty sound advice for what it is. It just comes from a little more of a cynical place. From his experience of what he's seen, that's kind of the knowledge that he's imparting on Mark. But what he says is, look, you are not invincible. And so this is when he gets his name. This is when he dons himself with the invincible name and says, that's who I'm going to be now. That's what my character's mantra is going to be about. Now, at this point, we basically kind of switch over to how all this happened in the first place. And we actually jumped to Mark when he was around seven years old and his father basically told him the origin of his life. Now, why you would tell this to a seven-year-old kid who probably can't even begin to comprehend it, I don't know, but he ends up telling it to his son when he's seven years old. And what we learn is that Mark's father, uh, Omni-Man, basically hails from a whole other planet called uh, Viltrum, I think it is. So I guess they're Vil Viltrum, Viltrumites, I think is what they're called, but he hails from a whole other planet. Now, this is kind of cool because remember, Kirkman has written for Marvel. You know, he's written his own comics. He's written a lot of publications across the board. While he hasn't written a lot of grand scale characters like Silver Surfer or Captain America or anything like that, he does have exposure to all those stories. And the guy's been reading comics, you know, for quite some time. And so what this does is it actually draws on the, on the history and the origin of the Silver Surfer. And that's kind of cool here because remember the Silver Surfer with this whole race that existed, they had eventually just sort of become uh, stagnant in the sense that they had just said, well, let's explore the stars. And once they explored everything there was to explore, there was no new mystery. The only new mystery out there was what happens after you're dead. And so some of them, you know, a whole bunch of his race, members of his race were going through and killing each other. Or they were experimenting with drugs and different things like that in order to just experience something new. And so because of that, his race more or less just kind of fell into stagnation for a time, which ultimately, you know, coincided with the arrival of Galactus and his desire to consume the planet. Norn Rad became the Silver Surfer and so on and so forth. But with this, this race fell very much in the same way. The difference here is that they gave themselves a singular purpose. They said, well, look, if we've basically done everything there is to do, and if we've seen everything there is to do, and we're godly powerful people in terms of the things that we could do, then let's be like a guiding force for the universe. And so the aspect of the Watcher is invoked, where it's like we're going to basically send these different individuals around the universe, and we're going to have them monitor other races and see if we can't have them, you know, allow them to progress to where we're at. So we're not really going to conquer them so much as bring them into the fold of gaining similarities or gaining powers or gaining technology in a manner that's akin to our own. And so what they did is they formed this sort of interstellar force. It was really more of an academy than anything else. And so, you know, students would go through the training process. They would submit themselves. You know, they would try to become viable candidates. And if they did, then they would in turn go out into space. Now, the other half of this was for these guys to basically create defense systems around the planets they were monitoring because it doesn't do any good to like say, hey, look, let's help this planet evolve 
off if like some other race comes along and destroys the planet then all the work was for nothing and so because of that they create this kind of protective defense around the different planets that they're monitoring but mark's father had stumbled across earth and the more he examined the planet from his own studies on on his his home world the more he came to the realization it's the planet he wanted to be on now this just makes good sense one of the things that's constantly hit at home on when it comes to comic books is that for whatever reason earthlings are intrinsically interesting like we are unique in the cosmos in a lot of different ways maybe it's because of the fact like in marvel comics some of the most powerful beings in the universe originate on the planet earth reality warpers you know omega level telepaths omega level telekinetics when it comes to the dc universe some of the most powerful and notable beings hail from the planet earth hal jordan from the planet earth you know when it comes to like superman he takes up residence on earth all these different heroes all these different characters originate with earth now, some of this is just kind of a byproduct of the fact that the stories take place on earth but in the greater marvel cosmology you've got a whole universe and you've got all different kinds of races and stuff but for whatever reason earth is just kind of the central point in which all major powers derive and so what ends up happening here is once this origin story has been told once mark's dad had basically taken up residence on earth become a hero and a savior for the planet he had met mark's mom he basically says look a time's going to come when your powers are going to manifest when your powers are going to crop up and when they do you are going to have to figure out how you're going to live. You're going to have to figure out your own role in the in, in, on the planet. I will guide you, but you're going to have to figure out what it is that you're about. Now, at this point, with Mark kind of going out and flying in the middle of the night and exploring and different things like that, he comes across the team team. Now, the team team... I do not need to tell you is a trope on the team the teen titans <laughs> that's basically what this is the teen titans but it's kind of cool i mean you've got like like robot which is basically cyborg uh and you've got a handful of others here and there you know eve for example is basically you know starfire but it's still kind of a cool thing because they have their own little personalities and stuff now the big kicker to this is that really in in this opening story what we're going to be doing here eve is going to have the most development i mean robot will have some but eve is going to have the most development out of anybody who's here which actually kind of makes sense because mark recognizes her he's like i know who you are don't i and then eventually you know getting back to school the next day you know when the, the team team's like hey look you know come hang out with us sometime we'll go on patrol you could join our team if you want so on and so forth he goes back to school and meets eve and it's like okay look i knew that was you like i definitely knew that was you now the funny thing about this is that because of the fact that mark is toying with the idea of being a teammate what this also does is it brings it to the equation a potential love interest now again all these different hallmarks of the superhero thing are being hit on here and one of the reasons why i'm really pointing these out is because it's very easy to look at like indie superhero comics and say well they're independent so like they're designed to break away from the status quo they're designed to be totally unique and totally different and in a lot of ways that's true you'll find a lot more interesting and a lot more quirky stories in indie publications than you will in like the you know the big three in marvel dc valiant comics and so because of that where you read image comics and you would get spawn who's like an anti-hero and like kills people you know he didn't really go through like the traditional hero's journey so to speak with regards to stories like this you end up finding that because this story was designed to be more relatable to the character of Spawn because this is an actual kid who just develops powers one day. So again, it's really kind of a cool scenario just because of the fact that working alongside the team team, they're able to take out, you know, a couple guys here and there, nothing too major. But again, it's basically demonstrating the fact that he would make a legitimate asset to the team. Now, while all this is going on, we pick up in Twin Pines Mall only to find out that a kid wakes up with a bomb attached to his chest, promptly detonating and killing, you know, however many people were caught in the explosion. So what this does is it creates this sort of dire circumstance, the need for something to be done, but also creates this little bit of a point of tension. The other half of this is that where Mark keeps talking to Eve just because of the fact that she's like his only connection to the superhero community outside of his dad, you know, Megaforce and, you know, the Global Guardians, whatever it is that they call themselves, the wrong signals are being sent <laughs> by Mark. The wrong signals are being put off. Mark is putting off the signals of, hey, like you're a superhero, I'm a superhero, let's go do super, you know, let's let's bump super uglies. Uh, her response is, look, like she's, she's with another guy. She's dating Rex. And this is kind of funny because the two of them kind of work as a team but mark's in this weird situation like he's kind of being friend zoned for the most part but what happens when you're being friend zoned by a chick that you kind of have to talk to i mean it's just kind of a weird scenario uh but the fact remains here everybody seems to comment on this like hey look like you know she's dating rex right and it's just kind of one of those funny little moments because at the end of the day the two of them do agree to work together they do agree for mark to be a little more involved with regards to the team but it's also mark kind of saying hey look i realize you're dating rex i'm not really in that i mean we know he's lying like we know he's just like when y'all split i'm making my move <laughs> that's exactly what's gonna happen but still you know it's kind of a cool scenario because we get the 
this really interesting interaction between Mark and his dad, right? Like they're just kind of flying around, you know, his, his dad's like, hey, look, let's just sort of go out on patrol. Or let's just go team up. In the midst of their little flying sessions, you know, his dad's just kind of like whisking off and saving a city or, you know, stopping a major incident or something along those lines. But it's kind of cool because again, this is designed to be a little funny. It's designed to sort of poke fun at things, but it's also just this really cool moment between like a superhero dad and his son. And so again, you know, from this point, we basically pick up with the idea of a, you know, a major conflict that's going on. And actually what ends up happening is Mark fights alongside his dad against some alien invaders. Now things go pretty smoothly. I mean, it's exactly what we would, as we would expect, you know, a father and son superhero team just sort of wrecking the bad guys. Uh, but in the middle of all this, and once a conflict is officially over, his dad immediately picks up on one of the missing kids that's been led to a mall. Now we're going to find out more about this. You know, we'll learn what the, the conclusion to this mystery is. And it's actually really kind of cool. But with regards to all this, one of the things that we see is that his dad is a little more brutal than we would expect in the sense that when his, when his kid shows up, his dad has super speed, super strength, different abilities, so on and so forth. But when he arrives on the scene, this kid's bomb is at three seconds. His dad just grabs a kid and throws him. I mean, he asks him, you know, quickly tell me who did this to you, but the kid doesn't have time to answer. And his dad just throws him into the sky and the kid blows up. This is one of the things that's kind of interesting because it begs the question, could his dad have potentially saved this kid? You know, could he have like grabbed the bomb off of him with the bomb of detonated? I mean, really with three seconds, there just may not have been enough time to ask that question, to do enough to figure out what's going on. And so his dad did the only thing he could do and just threw the kid into the sky so he would explode so nobody else would be killed. But in the midst of all this, one of the members of the previous aliens that we're fighting uh, grabs Mark's dad and just kind of takes off and that's really about it. And so again, what this does is it allows the story to organically shift away from, you know, Mark and his involvement with his father to solely on Mark. And that's one of the cool things about this is because again, it's an organic shift. It's an organic breakaway. And so of course, with Mark talking to his mom, this idea that, you know, his mom's trying to cope with the fact that her husband's basically missing, the idea that Eve and Mark are basically working together, keeping their eyes on things around them, seeing if they see anything suspicious. This is designed to do two things. The first is designed to basically, again, tote the idea of a potential love interest. But the second is with the whole idea of like their teacher kind of lecturing everybody and, and sort of talking about things that are going on and so on and so forth with the whole discussion of them looking around and seeing if they can spot anything. They don't see anything at all. And so it's designed to really hit it like inexperience because somebody there is the one that's committing all those crimes. And so that's one of the crazy things is because they don't know enough to know what to look for. They're teenage kids that have no real major big time experience as superheroes. They do what they can, but at the end of the day, they're not Batman. You know, they're not these super genius kids that know everything and know how to pick up on all these subtle clues and know how to solve every single crime they come across. And that's one of the benefits of this is because it's literally a story where you grow as the character grows. He becomes more intelligent. You grow as a person. It's just one of these cool scenarios. But ultimately we end up having a robot, you know, who's in the midst of a conflict, who is basically, you know, cross-referencing information with regards to, you know, all the people who work at the school, all the jobs they had before, what experiences they have, so on and so forth. And it inevitably leads them to the idea that the physics teacher, Mr. Hiles, or I guess David Hiles, is the one committing all these crimes just because of the fact that he was a weapons engineer for a company called Global Tech before he became a teacher. And so, of course, this leads Eve and Mark over to investigate David Hiles, which, of course, he promptly admits to what it is that he's done. Now, when it comes to scenarios like this, these only ever unfold one way. You know, when it comes to, like, the superhero showing up on the doorstep of the supervillain and saying, hey, look, uh, we don't know for sure that you're the one that did it, but we think you did. And he's like, yeah, I'm the one that did it. I'm the one that committed that crime. The guy's not going to go up without a fight. Like, something's going to happen. Somebody's going to walk in. There's going to be booby traps and the superheroes are going to be killed. Something nefarious is going to take place. With the character of David, he admits to everything that he's done. He basically says, look, there's a fourth missing student that nobody knows about this kid named Derek. Nobody knows that he's gone. Of course, you have Mark that tries to, you know, save him, but David Hiles immediately turns around and says, and now I'm going to kill you all because I've got a bomb on my chest. Now, the other half of this is David Hiles' motivation is rooted in the fact that his son was basically bullied and ended up committing suicide because of his experience. But he's basically kind of taking revenge on all the popular kids. Now, again, this is designed to basically kind of hit home at the idea of people who have been put down, people who have been picked on. I mean, not everybody takes the same road that his son did, but in some form or fashion, like we've all been picked on, right? Like whether it's some kid sitting behind a computer trolling people because he has nothing to do, or whether it's because it's a person who's going around in real life giving people a hard time because he doesn't have anything to do, whatever the case may be, everybody's been in a situation where they've been picked on, where they've been made to feel less about themselves. Now, some people get their revenge. Some people get their revenge by embarrassing the people who are picking on them. Some people take a more nefarious approach. But for the character of David Hiles, 
He's like, look, my son died because of these kids. They pushed him to that point. And so I'm literally just going to eliminate all of them. I'm going to kill off every last one of them. Now, the other half of this is that because of the fact that his son committed suicide, his son died, he basically ended up leading to a divorce that leaded to him losing his job. You know, his entire life fell apart. And so he sort of just had this mental breakdown, right? He's basically just kind of lost his mind and he's in a position where he's just going to attack all the different kids that he sees and kill them off in some vain effort to get his own revenge. Now, of course, this leads to Mark basically grabbing this guy and whisking him away and calling it a day. And that's really about it. But one of the other funny moments too is when Mark gets back, he gets back home. He asks, look, is dad back yet? And she, you know, his mom's like, no, he's not here yet. And so Mark goes upstairs, gets, you know, showered and everything. And his dad just kind of walks in and says, I need to shave. And his, his you know, his wife, you know, <laughs> Mark's mom is just kind of like, well, that's nice. And they just kind of talk about their days. Again, it's just like, none of this is spectacular to the family. It's kind of new to Mark in a lot of different ways, but his dad's like, yeah, like I was taken by this alien and I was put like in an enslavement camp. I lost my powers, but I managed to find a way to regain them. And then I led a rebellion and the scientists that I freed sent me back like this great, big, huge, grandiose event, right? You know I mean? It's just like this great, big, huge thing. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, that's cool. You know, that's, that's, that's nice. You know, all in a day's work. So again, it's kind of this, this really fun little story. It's just this really fun little thing. I enjoyed it. I thought it was really, really cool. But if you guys are new here to Comments Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.